We have a song book here. <laughs> yeah. and there might be one here, song book. So I was requested to speak something on Kadambakana Maharaj for tonight's presentation and also to sing one bhajan Yeyanila Premadan which is a bhajan we sing when we honor the disappearance of a great personality so I don't know is it possible to put it up on the screen? No? Hmm? It's not in the songbook? Should be there. I guess there is no one here that can operate this. Anybody? Okay. And the song is called Samsparsada Bhagavad Viraha Janiti Janita Vilapa mm -hmm. by Naratam Das Thakur. <clears throat> So, on the disappearance of a great personality, we honor his disappearance by honoring the Lord and many other great souls who also disappeared. <laughs> this song is so, it's actually very deep in the mood of separation. Vipalamba <laughs> Bhav. And it should be sung in that mood. <clears throat> should we wait? Or should we begin? No response. <laughs> you have it on your phone? Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Sam Sparsada Bhagavad Viraha Janita Vilapa is the title of the bhajan. So we'll begin. Yeya Nilo Prima Dana Karuna Prachu Uh -huh. 
हेनो पाप घोता गेला छायता खू घा मोर स्वरूप रूप घा सान था गुणा पति तभा भोर भात जुग घा खीरा घा खीरा खा गौतम घेला गौर नातरा भाषा कुटी भो माता आशिव रंग गुण निधि कौत गे पाभ संग संगी संगे ये कोई लीला से संग न भैया हे नारु थम हो धारो प्रेम घोरुनाजो घोरुनाजो हर है नौ खेलाचार्य धू वैष्णव ठाकुर वैष्णव ठाकुर वैष्णव ठाकुर ध्याय वैष्णव ठाकुर हाय ंग 
Jai Vaishnav Thakur Vaishnav Thakur Vaishnav Thakur Jai Vaishnav Thakur Jai Jai Vaishnav Thakur Vaishnav Thakur Vaishnav Thakur Jai Vaishnav Thakur Jai Jaya Kadambaka Nam Maharaj Jaya Kandavaka Maharaj Jaya Kandavaka Kana Maharaj Kadambaka Nam Maharaj Nithai Gaur Hari Vah Hari Vah Hari Vah Nithai Gaur Hari Vah Gaur Vimanande Hari Hal Kadamba Kanana Maharaj Ki Jai Do we have the copy of the English translation? <coughs> Anywhere? Yeah, on someone's phone, maybe? Yeah. So I'll read the translation. He who has brought the treasure of divine love and who was filled with compassion and mercy, where has such a personality as a Dvaita Charya gone? Where are my Sarupdhamara and Rupa Goswami? Where is Sanatana? Where is Raghunath Das, the savior of the most fallen? Where are my Raghunath Bhatta and Gopal Bhatta? And where is Krishna Das Kaviraj? Where did Lord Goranga go, the great dancer, suddenly go? I will smash my head against a rock and enter into the fire. Where will I find Goranga, the reservoir of all wonderful qualities? Be enabled to attain the association of Lord Garanga, accompanied by all of his these devotees in whose association he performed his pastimes. Naratam Das simply weeps. <laughs> oh. <Yeah. laughs> Magyan Timiranda Sya Ginajana Salakaya Chaksun Militam Yena Tasma Shri Guravena Maha. Maum Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gorvani Pracharine Nirvasesa Sunyavari Pasyatya De Satarine Vanshakopa Tarubhischa Kripa Sindhu Be Bhacha Pitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna, Jai Tanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasari Gauda Bhakta Vinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So when <coughs> a great personality and someone who is well known amongst the devotees depart, there always is a feeling of sadness, a feeling of loss, a feeling of um, wanting to have taken more advantage of such a person's association. We always feel like that. Like, I wish I would have spent more time, I wish I would have had more of his association. I wish I would have had more chance to do service. <clears throat> we always feel like that. It's kind of like the natural mood of separation, that there seems to be something short on our side. We always felt like there could have been more opportunities for me to take advantage. And when I first met Kadamba Kanana Maharaj, it was maybe 20 years ago, at least, maybe even more. 
and it was in uh, it was in Vrindavan Dam. Uh, I had been traveling, and I had come, and occasionally I would have visited Vrindavan, and so on many times they would ask me to give the Bhagavatam class, and uh, so giving Bhagavatam class in Vrindavan is quite uh, what we say uh, nerve-wracking. <laughs> It's kind of like you look out and you see all these great personalities there and there and you're, you're there in the most holiest of all dhams. And you have to give a class. <laughs> and you, th you really kind of like think, you know, I like to hide inside of the woodwork rather than give the class. <laughs> but you do it anyway because this is, the, this is our service and when we're asked to serve in that way, we just have to pray and and so when I would give class, and Kandambakanana Maharaj was at, the, at that time the temple president in uh, Vrindavan. And always, uh, throughout the years, I always felt a little bit uneasy with the, I don't know, the atmosphere was pure, but I wasn't so pure. <laughs> So I was feeling always a little difficult there. But when I would come, and when Kandamakanda Mars was there as the temple president, he would always um, somehow or other lift me up by his presence, sometimes by making a comment or asking a question in class just to inspire the class even more. And then I would, uh, after I would finish the class, I, of course I, don't, I didn't know him at, all, at the time. This was like our first meetings. Um, he would always be so nice to me. I was thinking, hmm, I never get this kind of response from the temple presidents in Vrindavan. Because <laughs> every year they would change 19 years, 19 different presidents. <laughs> to stay temple president in Vrindavan was one of the greatest austerities because there was only so many other energies circling around there it was quite difficult but he he accepted that difficult service and he lived in Vrindavan for many years and performing of course performing kirtan so my impression was oh, here's a very nice devotee that was my impression. He's, I can tell by nature he was very concerned and kind-hearted about how he dealt with devotees. So when I had that experience, I felt somewhat happy after giving my class, which many times in the past wasn't like that. <laughs> Obviously because of my own shortcomings. But he always made me feel like, yeah, thank you for giving the class. It was a nice class, even though it wasn't nice. <laughs> so I always felt comfortable in this association. I remember in 1995, I think it was 1995, I was in, uh, where was I? I was in Chicago at the time. And I heard a report, because after I met him in Vrindavana, we didn't see each other much after that. This was a few years later, 1995, I heard a report that he had been shot by uh, some devotee, who was actually a devotee, who tried to kill him. Yes, this is the way it was in Vrindavan. To be temple president in Vrindavan means to deal with the local mafia. We have that problem even today that you can't make too many changes otherwise the mafia might decide to move in. <laughs> and in the history of Vrindavan, the history of that, you'll see when Krishna was here what was it like to be in Vrindavan and the demons were 
attacking all the time. It says there were at least two demons per day attacking in Vrindavan. So whenever, whenever there's a holy place, the demons look for opportunities to, de to destroy it. Of course they can't, they get destroyed themselves. But this is the way it is, and we have now the same situation in Mayapur too, that, you know, there is so much illicit activities going on around that you have to be careful if you're devotees there, and especially if you're in the management. So Maharaj, uh, I guess, was, because he was of his pure nature, he was always trying to make changes for the improvement of the spiritual atmosphere. And so that wasn't so much appreciated by the local th mafia there. So they arranged for him to be killed. And he told me uh, what happened. And when I heard the news when I was in Chicago at the time, I was really shocked. I hadn't known him so well, but I took it very seriously. I took it really to heart because that little bit of an experience that I had with him was so sweet and so heartwarming that uh, although it was short, it really made an impression on me in my life. And then he told me, he used to tell me that it was on, I think it was, the date was, if I'm wrong, uh, January 21st, every year, that's when he was shot. He was shot in the back, in the lower part of the, just above the hip. And he would tell me that every year on that date, he would have tremendous pain from that. That same day, every year, the pain would come back really severe, like he was being shot again. <laughs> so I guess there is a certain uh, atmospheric, mood where when something happens on a particular date and that, ye, that day comes up the next year, there is some re-experience of that calamity or even maybe in, even from the positive side. But Krishna saved his life that time. He told me exactly what happened. He was sitting, he was in a, he was sitting on the toilet and somebody came from the back and pointed a gun right at his head, and it was just as soon as he pulled the trigger, Maharaj had got up, and I guess Krishna was in the heart. As soon as he got up, the bullet hit him in the back instead of, was aimed at his head. So he escaped death. <laughs> that was in 1995. Before then, he told me he was traveling in one Muslim country, I think. They were doing some preaching. I don't remember all of the details. But they were, I think it was, in, I think it might have been Bangladesh during the, you know, some of the early parts of the Bangladesh conflicts there with the with Islams and against the Hindus. So the Islamic army had captured a bunch of people, devotees, and they wanted to kill all of the Americans. <laughs> but And they thought he was an American. <laughs> so they put him up against the firing squad. But then he started to speak Dutch. <laughs> and he acted like he didn't know any English at all. <laughs> and he just kept speaking Dutch and then they realized he was an American. So they let him go. <laughs> so twice, yeah. And uh, Prahlada Nandamars was telling me just the other day, yesterday, a couple of days ago, that him and, uh, and Kandama Kandamars had many experiences together where they both just escaped the hands of death. It happens to devotees a lot who preach. We somehow, I mean, at least three times somebody pulled a gun on me when I was out <laughs> preaching. <laughs> And one guy was very serious. So, you know, when you're preaching, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> so, Pallad Nandamaraj and Mara and Kadamba Kanahar were ride, driving in a car, and they were talking, comparing the different times that they escaped death. And while they were talking, the engine blew up in the car and caught on fire. <laughs> Just when they were talking about how they escaped death, 
the car's engine blew up and it was on fire. They had to run out of the car. So, so you know, padam padam, ya vi padam. It's a dangerous place. You never know what will happen next. But Krishna, if the Krishna factor was always there in the lives of the devotees, and I can, I can talk about so many senior devotees who had similar experiences in their life where they just narrowly escaped, you know, death. It's just, for those who are out regularly preaching, and you find these experiences happen. <laughs> so Maharaj, um, but he was, he was a person that was yeah, quite fearless in his Krishna consciousness. He wanted to take chances, he wanted to preach. And so he, he carried on preaching, and then he started to develop more and more into the mood of kirtan. That came a little bit in the early parts of that, even before then when he was in Vrindavan, but it really developed when he traveled in the, the western countries, especially in the UK and in other areas of the world. So he really started to develop the whole mood of kirtan. I remember his kirtans were so powerful that I remember, you remember the Beatles? Yeah. Well, if you know the history of the Beatles, when the Beatles used to sing, I mean, women would scream at the top of their lungs and faint, and then they would, ha they would always have ambulances outside of the Beatle concerts, because the women would just go into ecstasy and start screaming. And then they would have to carry these ladies out. <laughs> I guess it may might have happened to the men too, but there's no record, no record of that. But. <laughs> And so I was in Germany one time, and we were, Sanchi Nandana Maharaj had organized these series of kirtan programs each year in Germany, you know, starting in around the year 2008, 9, 10, and 11. And he found this beautiful resort area, some remote place in Germany, I can't remember where. It was not so far from Leipzig. And, uh, we were, you know, it was a long list of kirtan ears chanting, so Kadamba Ganamara was there. And I was outside, I was outside the hall, I wasn't in the kirtan. And then I heard this kirtan going on, and, and people were screaming. <laughs> Ladies. <laughs> and they were just like yelling and jumping up, and, and then I walked in and I said, wow. <laughs> and then I stayed for the kirtan. And he was a, he was able to you know inspire such devotion in people, and many times that when he would sit down to begin to sing, people would start dancing before he even start singing. They would get up. He would say, "Just sit down, wait for a while." You know? <laughs> now his kirtans were so deep in devotion. It wasn't that he was just, you know, musically inclined, which he was. He was very musically inclined. And he also had a lot of, you know, like power behind his kirtans. They were full of his enthusiasm. And, you know, of course, at the end, sometimes he would get wiped out. <laughs> He's so tired from the kirtans. And I would talk to him. And he would say, slow down, Maharaj. He said, I can't. <laughs> I can't slow down. Just the way it is. So that was his mood to put all his heart and soul and all his energy into kirtan. And we all had, of course, maybe most of us here have had experience with Maharaj's kirtans that are just, just unbelievably powerful. And and so, uh, and he, I would always meet him, in, in, especially in Radhadesh Mellows, every year he would be there. Which I can actually say, and I might be challenged, but still I'll make this statement, I think it's the best kirtan program in the entire ISKCON society is Radhadesh Mellows. <laughs> Why? Because it's so sweet. It's the most sweetest atmosphere you can ever imagine. And always the top, top like kirtans, kirtaniers come from all over the world to be there. 
a Maharaj would come practically every year and sing. And he would blow the roof off the, off the building you know, on his kirtans. And I would be checking to see if any of the pillars were breaking. Or, because the kirtans were so full of high energy, but also so much devotion combined. When you have that two combinations of high energy with devotion, sometimes we see kirtaniers, they have a lot of energy. But sometimes when you put a lot of energy in it, the, the devotion element starts to diminish because of the high energy. But when, when Maharaj used to sing with that such high energy, the devotional element would just go up and up and up. So his kirtans were... And then we would meet many times. We met in Germany, and in London, in Vrindavan. A few years ago, we met in Vrindavan. He was singing, and he, when he would see me, he would become happy, and then he, because he knows I like to dance, <laughs> and then I would inspire, try to inspire all of the other devotees to get involved with the kirtan. And then, when everybody starts dancing, when the kirtan is going, then the whole atmosphere becomes powerful. So we would meet, yeah, Radha Desh Mellows, Mayapur, so many times in Mayapur, we, da we chanted and danced together. He even danced with me many times. Yeah. He would do his uh, particular Dutch style dance, <laughs> which I can't really describe. <laughs> but it was really unique, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> And very, very pleasant to watch. So many, a couple of times he would get up when he would be singing, and then he'd just get up and start dancing. <laughs> so we wouldn't. That would happen in Mayapur, and it happened once in Vrindavan also. So we would meet there, and then Radha Desh Mellows, Germany, Bhakti Vedanta Manor. In other places around the world, we would always be, it would it would be amazing, and Goloka Dam in Germany also. And it would be amazing, every time I'd go to a kirtan program, he'd be there, and I would think, hey, this is good. <laughs> so he inspired so many in kirtan, and he left so many, so many people with so much happiness in, in, in kirtan that it's a legend that has really been established in Niskan so nicely. And you see, even in his last days before he disappeared, um, you know, I spoke with Jayadvaita Maharaj, who's his guru, Maharaj. And this was in July of last year. And we were at, uh, we were at a kirtan program in Leicester, no, Birmingham. And I was speaking about, you know, well, you know, you know, Kadambakana Maharaj, he's got cancer, but he's not doing anything about it. He's just going to let it go. And Jayadvaita Maharaj was really clear in saying, yes, he doesn't want to waste time running this way and that way, and this doctor, this doctor, he's going to use his, his time, whatever his time is left, simply to stay fully engaged in devotional service. So he did that. He didn't, uh, as soon as he heard that, the, you know, the cancer was was quite, what we say, developed, he didn't think, well, I'm going to spend so much time fighting it. Most of us would have probably went the other route and tried to dis 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 do something. But he accepted it as you know, Krishna's arrangement because for a great soul, you know, the, the, the message of death is not something that they fear, it's something that they get ready for. And that's all. Uh, they welcome death as an, as an opportunity to again re attain Krishna's association in the spiritual world, or at least come to the point of associating with Krishna somewhere in the material world. So there's, for a great soul, they don't fear death. For us, it's a it's a loss because when someone when somebody we love or somebody who is dear to us is somebody who has made such a a deep impression in spreading Krishna consciousness around the world, it's a loss to our whole society, to our whole preaching force. 
and we feel that loss also. But we know that this is the inevitable process that Prabhupada says, as long as you have a, a material body, you have to understand death will come at a certain point. So Maharaj understood that, having escaped death so many times in his life, I mean, innumerable times, he came so close to leaving the body. But now he understood, I think, that this is Krishna's way of uh, concluding my activities in the material world. And so he accepted it. And fearlessly, he just, you know, after spending time in some of the Western countries meeting devotees, he, in September he decided to, you know, make his way to Vrindavan. But while he was in Vrindavan, he was still preaching. He was still giving kirtans. It was like, for some people, he was like, it was the same person. He never really diminished in his devotional service. He stayed fixed in chanting, dancing, preaching, inspiring devotees, and coming on to speak to his disciples and others about what he was going through and how they should see it also. Because it says, and you'll see, it's, this is written in the Shastras, that when the spiritual master leaves, the disciple cries. <laughs> it's just natural. The disciple feels a great loss. But that crying is actually their, their love for the spiritual master. But when you look at it from the, the, the pure spiritual point of view, it's like there was one great soul, I can't think of his name. It's mentioned in this Shastra, is that he was leaving the body, obviously he was about to depart, and disciples were around, they were also crying. And then he looked at them, and he said to them, you're crying for me, but I should be actually crying for you because you have to stay in this material world. <laughs> so that is the consciousness of a, a person who understands what is the actual truth of life. That life is to prepare yourself for death. That's the only, that's the only meaning, meaning of life. Life is to mean to prepare yourself for death. That whatever time is left in our life, that time is, must be used in order to prepare. Of course, when we're young, we still have so many ideas on how we're going to enjoy this world and how many things we're going to do and how many plans we're going to make and how many places we're going to go and how many achievements we're going to do. That's you. That's youth. But when you get older, you start thinking, "Boy, why did I waste time with all of that?" <laughs> So, but uh, one who knows, understands that, yeah, I just like Bhakti Tirtha Swami, he wrote that book just before he left, Die Before Dying. And in there he describes all of the things you have to die to before you can actually leave the world in the proper consciousness or Krishna consciousness. Our attachment to friends, relatives, family members, our money, our possessions, our plans, <laughs> all of these things we have to let go. <laughs> and Kadama Maharaj, I think he let it go many times. He just didn't even, just stayed fixed in devotional service. Because as a sannyasi, he, he had no plans for enjoyment in the material world. But, a devotee wants to stay and preach as long as they can so they can help in many conditioned souls as they can to bring them closer to Krishna or even back to Krishna. So the devotee thinks like that. And let me stay as long as I possibly can and try to help as many as persons as I can because this is what pleases Krishna, this is what pleases Lord Chaitanya. The devotee thinks like that, but when he gets the message that it's time to go, and then all of a sudden everything focuses on whatever time I have left, let me purify whatever t 
faints of material desires I still have and get ready to ultimately to make that journey back to Godhead. Because everything in this world is ephemeral. There's one story I remember I was once. I was in Beverly Hills, California. I don't know if you know what Beverly Hills, California is. It's where all the all the movie stars and all of the big movie producers, people who are in Hollywood, they live, authors and very important people. So we were, I was connected with this one author. He was, and he liked Krishna conscious, so we, he invited me to come to speak to his friends. And all of his friends were like highly placed people in the movie industry. So I had to give a lecture to these people. <laughs> So I'm thinking, all right, what am I going to say to these people? They got money, they got prestige, they got a lot of things. So what am I going to tell them? So I was really, you know, struggling to think of what to say. And then I remember there was a little story that I heard. There's just some little analogy about life. So I thought I could, I said, all right, let me start with this <laughs> see how it goes <laughs> so the story goes like this there was one greedy merchant he had four wives <laughs> and his fourth wife was his favorite wife his third wife was his second favorite his second wife was his third favorite and his first wife he'd completely neglected And so now he gets the message. The doctor tells him, my dear greedy merchant, <laughs> you're, you only have six months left in life. There's no cure for your disease, so make your plans. So now he's scared. He doesn't know what to do. Life is short. He lives simply to gain material things. So he, he decides to talk to his first w fourth wife, his favorite wife. He says, my dear wife, I'll be leaving soon. Would you go with me? She says, Haribo, nice knowing you, <laughs> but no way. <laughs> um, so he thinks, all right, let me try the third wife. So he goes to the third wife. And he explains the situation. Will you come with me? She says, well, actually, um, after you leave, I'll get married again. <laughs> so he's thinking, oh my God. Goes to the second wife. I'm telling this to these rich people now. <laughs> he goes to the second wife and says, my dear wife, you know, I'm leaving, I'm sick. Could you come with me? She says, well, you know, I'll, I'll go to the grave where they bury you, but as far as I can go. <laughs> and so he's, now he's embarrassed. The first wife, which he neglected all the time, he's thinking, I have to ask her. She's the only one that's left, but I never gave her any attention. I never gave her any affection. Nothing. So he goes, and now he's desperate. His only the only wife left. So he asks her, tells her his situation. My dear wife, would you come with me? She says, I'll never leave you. So I told that story. So what are the four wives? The fourth wife is the body. It's the most dearest thing to us. So when we leave the world, the body stays here. <laughs> the third wife is our possessions, our money. So when we leave, somebody else gets it. <laughs> I'll get married again. <laughs> the second wife is our friends and our relatives. They come to the grave to see us off, and that's as far as they go. <laughs> and the first wife is the soul. The one we neglected throughout our whole life and said, I'll never leave you. <laughs> Some people also use it. It's, that it's actually Krishna, the first wife. 
So I told that story <laughs> to all of these rich people. <laughs> I mean, that was a blockbuster. <laughs> I didn't know what they were going to say. You know, because these people are, you know, they got prestige, they got money. You know, at the end, and then of course I spoke in general after that, at the end, they all, many of them came up and appreciated the story. They said, thank you. And many of them sat down and told me how miserable they were. <laughs> how, you know, they've been married a couple times. They had... Uh, they had, you know, so, you know, they had, their lives were a mess. Although they were big people in Hollywood and had a lot of money and some popularity, still so none of them were happy. Some of them didn't even talk to me. <laughs> but a few, many of them actually did and wanted to hear more about what is this Krishna consciousness. But that story really illustrates the story of life, is that... The body, it'll go. Whatever we have, everybody else gets when we leave. Our relatives and friends, they, they'll, they'll come to the grave, but that's about all. But Krishna never leaves, never leaves us all. So that is the, that is the success that whatever time, and Kadamba Kana Maharaj was really amazing. He showed by example how to face death in the most noble way, in the most Krishna conscious way. Live your life just serving until the time comes and stay engaged in devotional service. What will happen? What will happen? Nobody can understand how things in this world are very unpredictable. So, as long as we stay fixed in Krishna consciousness, whether we're living or we're on our way out of this world, we're in the best situation because while we're living, we're happy, and when, when, we, when we leave, we actually attain this, the platform of supreme happiness and association with Krishna if we perfect our lives in pure devotional service. So, for a devotee, there's never any loss. <laughs> But for us, for us who are still here in the material world, the us who had a relationship with such great personalities, such as Kadamba Kanana Maharaj, and others who have also departed, yeah, we always feel like, why Krishna, why did you take that person? <laughs> but Krishna's perfect, Krishna's perfect, whatever he does, he does, Perfectly, and he has, and he knows that what is actually best for everyone. But he's also teaching us that you know, when everyone, someone close to us leaves the world, it's a message that we can learn from how to live our life in such a way as to not waste time trying to chase after the things of this world, which are, you know, here today and gone tomorrow. <laughs> But to live your life in devotional service, Kadamba Kanamaraj was really, really the epitome or the height of perfection in that area. He gave himself a hundred percent, just like when we were in the COVID lockdown. He didn't like it at all. He wanted to preach. He wanted to travel. So he was one of the first to break out of it. He told his disciples, some of them that were here. I want to buy a car and I'm going to travel all over Europe and just preach. And he did. <laughs> he bought a brand new car and they started tri yeah, traveling this way and that way, going this way. So he was, uh, he didn't really appreciate, you know, not being able to move around. He wanted to continue. And all of my experiences with my rides were always so nice and so pleasant and so friendly. He was very personal. I remember when the last time I saw him here, after the class, when he got off the Vyasa Sun, and when he came up and we start talking, and he's just asking, how are you, and how are things going, what are you doing, and it's just always friendly, nice talks. And we also would talk about, you know, sometimes we joke about things. <laughs> but that was his mood, he was very personal, very friendly. Very down to earth. 
yeah, very spiritually powerful at the same time. And, uh, yeah, and I think th those of us who are here in Ljubljana are quite fortunate because he spent so much time here. And in fact, he, this was one of his favorite places to come in the world. And he, of course, uh, took some of the devotees here and made them his, your brother, right? His uh, personal associates. I'll tell you what happened to me the other morning. It's the same, the same morning he left. I was thinking, I just saw a Bhagavad Dharma the other night, and it was, 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 um, it was uh, Gaur Purnima. So I said to Bhagavad Dharma, you know, I want to write to Kadamba Kanamars. I think he's going to leave soon. I want to write to him. So give me a, can you give me the email address of your son? So he did. So the next day I was so busy that I didn't write. And then the following day, the morning of the 9th, I got up and I was just ready to start japa. And my program is, I don't do anything until my japa is finished. I finish, just sit and chant 16 rounds. Don't try to talk to me. <laughs> and, I, and I'm just like, I'm just out of the office, you know. <laughs> and so I was all ready to sit down. And then this feeling, strong feeling came over right to Maharaj. And I was thinking, hmm, I'll finish my job first, and then I'll write. But the feeling came again, came, came again. and I, this time I said, I don't usually do this. I always do my job first, but Krishna's telling me I should write, so I did. So I went, I opened my computer, it was 3.30 in the morning, <laughs> and I started to write a letter. And I wrote, and then I spent some time writing the letter. And then after I was done, I thought, well, I'll go back later and then edit it and fix it up and make it even nicer. And I was going to shut the computer, and then I heard a voice said, no, finish it now. <laughs> and then I thought, all right, Krishna, <laughs> i got to listen. <laughs> so I finished the letter now. And that was, I was 5 o'clock in the morning when I finished the letter and I sent the letter at that time. So that five o'clock, that was 10.30 in the morning in Vrindavan. And he left it an hour and a half later. It was just an hour and a half. So Krishna allowed me to, you know, write that letter while he was still personally present. Of course, I'm not sure if it got read to him or not. And even if it did, hey, he was in a state of quite internal mood at that time. But at least I was able to write the letter while he was still personally present, and I felt really good about that. It's Krishna's mercy. So, yeah. Um, so he reasons out the say that Vaishnavas die when thou art still living in sound. Vaishnavas die to live in and living, spread the holy name around. So Maharaj is some who goes, some who goes somewhere else and start doing kirtan. <laughs> some other planet, or maybe Krishna will take him back to the spiritual world. But whatever it is, a devotee, his destination is always glorious, it's always auspicious. Their lives are glorious and their destination is auspicious. So, and they leave behind so much that we can learn from, they inspire us in our Krishna consciousness, they teach us things that are valuable that we can use to, to make advancement. I see, see, pancha tattva ki jai. And they, they, they help us in so many ways to, to, to show us the importance of being dedicated to devotional service. So we always remember that. So we are indebted to great souls because, you know, because of them we're able to you know, continue on in our Krishna consciousness with enthusiasm. They, they, they lay the path for us to follow. 
And if we follow that path, it's auspicious. <laughs> like that. So, uh, when Maharaj left, I didn't feel any sadness. It happens to me a number of times. Because I know there's certain times when a person leaves, you know it's so glorious that there is no reason for sadness. But the sadness will come later, after some time. So it always happens like that. After some times when we feel the loss. But initially, when it happens, at least this is my experience, and it's experience of many devotees. That happened to me when my dear disciple Johnny Ginath left in two years ago, and a year and a half ago in London. He'd been fighting cancer for at least six years. Finally, the cancer took him. But he was also practically fixed in devotional service all the way up to the end. And when he left, it was a celebration. All his rel not only his, all, not only the devotees, but even the relatives. His relatives told me, it doesn't feel like a death, it feels like a wedding. His mother told me that. <laughs> the mother of the son, yeah. So when sometimes when a great soul, Krishna just lets you know, hey, it's glorious. <laughs> He's now with me. <laughs> so, so if we live our life in that way, we'll also have that same experience that when we leave the world, it says that for a pure devotee, when they leave the world, there is no time between the time they leave and the time that they enter into the spiritual world. It's timeless. You can't measure any time. It's, it's instantaneously. And contrary to that, the more sinful a person is, the more they have to wait for their next body. But for a pure devotee, it says, it's like going to sleep and waking up in the spiritual world. <laughs> it's like that, but as it's described, it's in the fourth canto in the Bhagavatam, it explains that, and it's just instantaneously, there's no time that you could say happened between the time they left and the time they, it's just the soul is immediately there with the spirit, in the spiritual world. So for that kind of, that kind of departure, there's no pain. It's just, you know, riding on the, the, you know, the airship of the spiritual airplane <laughs> back to the spiritual world. So, yeah, so we shouldn't fear death. We should fear wasting time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, well. Let us use your time in the most beneficial way to become Krishna conscious. Then when that moment comes, then Taktwa Deham Purna Janmani Nati Sorjuna, back home, back to God. Life is successful. Because we've been living in this world, how many lives? We can't count. <laughs> Millions in different species. Karanam Guru Sangha Sarasa Sajoni Janmasa. So many species of life. And now we made it to the human form, and then how many human forms have we made, have we done until we actually came in contact with the bona fide spiritual master, which is so rare. And so, one who does that is so fortunate. But if you have, if you have a good fortune, but you can't take advantage of the good fortune, that is even more, that is a great form of, of misfortune, sadness. So we are very fortunate. We've come to the path of pure devotional service. And now we have a chance to, to solve all problems of life and return again to our home in the spiritual world. So if, if that means using our time in the, in the way that is beneficial for making advancement in Krishna consciousness. So death is not the fear. The fear is wasting time. <laughs> Because there are people who die in the world and they say, oh my God. While they're dying, they said, oh, I wasted so much time. I could have been doing other things that are more beneficial. <laughs> Don't come to that point. 
don't 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 sing that song that I could have did more. Give everything you can while you're here, and then when the time comes, it's then you happily leave the world, <laughs> knowing that it's the destination is perfect. Or, so that was Maharaj. Uh, he was an example. Someone should write a book on his life as an experiment to help us understand deeper what it means to actually be fixed in pure devotional service. He was amazing. Really amazing. He gave every every ounce of energy to in service. <laughs> Okay, so we're after a little after eight. Anybody want to say anything? Any any comments or Bhagavad Dharma? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna. Hare Bol. Um, my sons told me that uh, on. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. My my sons told uh, told me that on the day uh, when he left Maharaj, um, just before starting to leave his body, Nitai uh, came to his room and uh, started to perform um, worship. Uh, of Giriraj. Perform what? Worship. Worship. Puja. Puja. Uh, for Giriraj. Because this was his uh, deity. His deity. And uh, when when Nitai offered um, incense and and uh, and flower, the Maharaj uh, made the same gestures with his hand as Nitai. So he made his puja along with Nitai. Oh wow! Uh, and then he turned on his back and started to leave, leave his body. Uh, so his last act was worshiping his deity, yes. covered on. Yes, exactly. It's beautiful, huh? And Krishna inspired that. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that's beautiful. Really wonderful. You hear that? Because that moment is like the moment <laughs> when you're leaving. What are you thinking about? So he was worshiping when he was leaving. <laughs> that means he That means his his life his destination is perfect. <laughs> Something else? One thing more. Um, the day before he left, uh, he tried to say th something, and they uh, tried to understand him. And then he said the last words, mission above all. Say again? Mission above all. Mission above all. Above all, yes. Oh, the mission of Lord Chaitanya. Yes. Uh. Yes. That was his. Uh, that was the last, his last words. Mission above all. Yes. Keep focus on what what his life is all about. Is to spread Krishna consciousness. Yeah, he lived it. He spoke it. And he lived it. And he taught it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I remember that, that that it really inspired me when he, during the lockdown, he was one of the first to break out and just want to go out and travel and preach and not stay, you know, restricted. <laughs> yeah, a devotee is fearless because they know Krishna is there. Nice mission above all. Maybe somebody should write a book and that would be the title. 
make that the title of the book, Mission Above All. I don't have enough experiences in my own personal relationships with him to, to actually write anything extensive, but there are people who really knew him well and spent much time with him, and especially when he was preaching in Germany. He's preached a lot in Germany. He preached a lot in Holland also. He preached a lot in the UK. Those who knew him really, really well. Well, I remember when he was doing Kirtan in the UK. This was in, uh, it was in, just be, yeah, it was in around August or something around there. Yeah, it was around August time. I came to the Kirtan. And you know I'm a little crazy, so. And I don't like seeing people sitting down during kirtans. <laughs> so I, I got everyone up to dance, and he was so happy. And I, I think the mood was people wanted to sit down. And you know, in, in the UK, the temple is so small, and the congregation is so large. <laughs> It's so tight in there. <laughs> but still, when we started the dance, everything broke loose. And he was just smiling. <laughs> so I felt good that you know, I did some service. <laughs> Anyone else would like to say something? Disciples here? Mm -hmm. One, two, three, four. Okay. So, those of you, you know, who are disciples, just, uh, it is difficult, but you should know that what will please Maharaj is that if you continue on and be enthusiastic in your devotional service and don't let this disappearance temper or water down your enthusiasm. Sometimes that happens. I remember when we were, I was there when Bhakti Tirta Swami disappeared. It was 2005, June 27th. I was in Gita Nagari at the time. And we had an all night ceremony. Started around nine o'clock in the night and ended at four o'clock in the morning. And the next day the devotees were really really, really distraught. Some of them said, I can't go on. <laughs> I can't go on. I don't know how I'm going to go on. And I was there with one other sannyasi, Dhanadhar Swami, and we spent the whole day just talking to the devotees, trying to encourage them that if you want to really please your spiritual master, you know, Use this opportunity to increase your Krishna consciousness. Do it as a service to him. And that way he'll be very happy. Because the most happiest thing that the, the, the spiritual master sees 